Listen, I don't know how you've been feeling so far, but I feel a little wound up. I'm just trying to contain it. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like the calm. Because I really feel like the Lord is doing something today. Sometimes you want to know, all right, Lord, what do you want to do? He says, let's do it. And you're like, yes, but what, Lord? What exactly do you want to do? Man, I'm, I'm really proud of our, our, our worship team. Like David Fish, I'm proud. That's a hard song to like throw out there. You know what I mean? So here's, here's what I think you learned from that. Yeah, they don't need your, your claps. You know, they're not even in the room. It's all right. But sometimes you got to take a risk in worship. I felt like that's what I was, I was like learning like right now. I was like, man, sometimes you got to take a risk. You just got to step out there and try to sing a song that you're not sure where, where is this going to land. Are y'all good for this? Have y'all heard this before? We're going to try this. I'm going to go back. I'm going to kind of go back 15 years ago and pull out a song that I, I saw God move in. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. Let's see if the Lord wants to show up. Because, you know, I think it's just a matter of like your worship. And it's just like there's history in the room, even when you're new. You know what I mean? There's just like the Lord's been doing things for a very long time. You know, revival, well, here's what I love. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my way here, right? but you got to follow like culture. How many of you know that culture, our society is jacked up? Amen, right? Listen, if you've ever studied history, I think history is interesting. You've heard this before, though. History repeats itself. And we always say that from a negative place. I want to get off the negative. Let's get to the positive. You know that history repeats itself? Renewal and revival comes after every time a culture starts getting a little jacked up, messed up. Like the renewal begins to happen. And I think like, I just, I feel like it's almost like a tidal wave. We all, we, we always see the wave crash into the beach, right? We always talk about the waves. We forget that there's this recoil that begins to happen, this loading back up, right? It's the undercurrent. And I feel like that the Holy Spirit is like the master of undercurrent kind of all we may have crashed as a group but man the undercurrent begins to pull us back and bring us back home and it's just this place in your life where you go like man everything's messed up now what I mean, do you feel that? I feel that as like a pastor of a church. I've talked to other pastors. I feel like so many people in church were like, now what do we do? What what do we do? Like what do you, what do you do? Like do we do we storm the beaches? There is no beach. Right? <laughs> What, what do you do right now? Where, where are you at? When you watch the news, how many of you watch the news, you feel more depressed afterwards, almost because you're not sure what to do. I love the mess. David Fish can preach his dang socks off, man. I love listening to David Fish preach. And man, when he was talking about like virtue signaling, I was like, because sometimes that's all we got is what it feels like. I, what do we do with what's going on? So culture at large is jacked up. And this week we were just talking about it, like in the car. And I love it because my wife is like, man, people, we just need Jesus. I talked to Pastor Curtis Jefferson. He's been, he, he just retired, which, you know, as a pastor, there's no such thing as retirement, right? He, he's the pastor. He, he was the pastor, but he was over there at New Hope Baptist. We had him come preach here one time. I remember I went to him, you know, in the midst of just some crazy stuff. And I was like, I don't know what to do, man. I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm new on the scene here. What, what do I do? Like, how do I preach into this? How do we help like racial reconciliation? How do we, how do we lean into this? Our, our, remember when all this protests were going on, all this madness? I'm like, I don't know what to do. He goes, just give him Jesus. And I thought, that's a man with some wisdom. So can we, can we collectively, how many of you believe that our society needs Jesus to correct itself? Right? Okay, show of hands. Okay, great. I'm glad we're all on the same page. Y'all about to get, whew, all right, you ready for this then? That means we got work to do. That means you can't go to the voter box and fix anything that you believe. That means that there's no amount of news that you're going to watch that's going to fix it. It literally means you've got to now take Jesus to somebody else. When our culture is hurting and dying and broken and it needs Jesus, that means it needs you. The culture needs you to take Jesus with you and say, I want to introduce you to someone that can help fix what's going on right now. Not fix you, but fix what's going on out here because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. There's spirit and principalities. There are things that are going on, spiritual forces that are fighting the church and other people. They're trying to take people down. The enemy has come to steal, kill, and what? Be your friend? No, destroy you. Destroy everyone around you. He's no respecter of persons. He's trying to get everybody. And if we believe that the solution is Jesus, that means when we come in here, it should change something about the way we gather together as a group of people. Man, we, we get all up in arms. We talk about, remember, y'all remember 2020? 
we tried to purge it. Do you remember our church was out for 10 weeks? I, I now get like, like a little perturbed that that even happened. I get it. I get it, right? COVID is real. It's still going around. People are still getting sick. I've prayed over people who passed away and people who made it. I've been there. I've, I've like done some funerals, you know what I'm saying? Like, so I know that it's a real thing. But you know what hacks me off the most? is that whenever, whenever the church has so lost its vision to come together, has nothing to do with COVID. It's that literally so many people got used to the idea of like, you know, I don't really need other people. I'll just do this on my own. Like, no, 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 no. No, there, there is history in the room. There were people worshiping and praising God, writing songs long before we ever got together and thought about having a Sunday service. We would do well to listen to the theology and the life of other people who have gone before us and say, hey, I don't have all the answers. I don't have them, do y'all? Nobody's got all the answers. But we do know this, Jesus does. You know what churches need? Churches need to be full of people with wisdom and understanding. We need to be the people who are wise and understanding. And if you or somebody says today, man, that I have walked with the Lord, I have wisdom and understanding, I'll say the only way that I know you've got wisdom and understanding is if you're actually raising up people around you to also gather the wisdom and understanding. If you are literally on your own with your own wisdom and understanding, you'll find yourself in a field with nobody around you. You've led nobody. But if you're somebody who says, man, I don't have that wisdom and understanding. I want to grow. And like, listen, just, just be honest with yourself. Say, I want to grow. I do, this with, I do this for myself every day. Lord, help me. Like, I need some wisdom and understanding. I'm going to get a new book. I'm going to read something else. I'm going to take in more stuff. I'm going to read. I'm going to pray. I'm going to talk to somebody else. I'm going to ask questions like, hey, how would you preach this? How would you do this? Hey, how would you pray into this? Hey, what's God doing? What are you hearing? What am I hearing? Like we have to collectively come together because the spirit of God moves in us and through us. And so we're in the the book of James, right? James has been kind of a hard book. And I, I remember James chapter one, verse 19, he said this. He said, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. You know, when the Bible says to take note of this, we should probably be like, I'm gonna get a pen and paper and literally write it down and think on it, stew on it, marinate on it, let this little brisket in my mind sit in the smoker for a little longer than 30 minutes. You know what I mean? You ever ate a 30-minute brisket? No, because it's disgusting. (laughs) That's why when you get wisdom, you've gotta let it, you know, soak up something. So he says this, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen. Slow to speak and slow to become angry. What does he say? Brothers and sisters in Christ need to be quick to listen. Here's what I'm saying. We have to be quick to listen. That's literally what it says. In other words, all this stuff about Roe v. Wade that just happened, man, we get to celebrate. We say, thank you, Jesus. Like, please, let's not have any more abortions. Let's not do this anymore, right? This is what we would hope. But listen, here's the problem. Whenever Roe v. Wade went away, when he pulled it out, guess what happened? Nothing. The hearts of the people continue to say, I still want abortions in my life. People continue to have divide. You can't legislate morality. Do you see what I'm saying? So we, here's the deal. You know what's going to hurt the church more than anything? If we find a hill to die on and we say, like, we're just going to shout at everybody else but never have any understanding, never ask anybody, hey, what would actually lead you to the place here? And I'm not going to ask you any questions. I just want you to speak. I just want to hear. I just want to be available. How can I minister to you? How can I listen to your heart? How can we, like, but if we're not careful, we'll get to this place where we were not quick to listen, but we were really fast to speak. And what we, what we can do very quickly is we can isolate ourselves from other people who believe in Jesus. You know, there's actual believers in Jesus who actually think abortion's okay. Listen, you know what that tells me? It means we're not listening enough. We've got to have some, I've got to come to some kind of understanding what is going on in your life. Not just in the Roe v. Wade. There's so many other situations that are going on in the world. What would lead people to do the bad things that they do? I watched on the news this week as three women tore up a restaurant over a dollar something sauce that they didn't want to pay money for. I could easily just go like, shame on you. You're terrible, horrible people. Or I could say, tell me, what led you to the place in your life to where $1.20 for a Chick-fil-A sauce caused you to lose your marbles? I wouldn't say it that way. Do you see the benefit? And maybe just, maybe just, like my son has to go to school with other kids. How many of you send your kid to school with other kids? How many of you very quickly, when that kid gets picked on by the other kids, you're like, hey, listen, that kid's lashing out because of his home life. Man, if we knew that, be like, hey, Tristan, be slow to speak and quick to listen. Listen to his heart. 
Why do you think he's calling you those names? He heard it from somewhere else. Maybe that's going to give you a chance to share the love of Jesus with him. Quick to listen. Hear somebody out. Here's the key to being quick to listen. Don't say a word. Quick to listen means I'm going to listen so that I can hear everything you have to say. I'm going to let it soak in. I'm not going to. But. No, you say, I'm just going to listen. I'm not going to say a word. I just want to hear what you have to say. And then I'm going to allow for the Holy Spirit to take what you said and help me to process that. Because guess what? There may be some truth in there that I needed to hear. The next part says this, we got to be slow to speak and slow to become angry. And this is where I'm going to lead us into it. Are you allowed to speak and be angry? James says yes, but you got to be slow to it. Slow to speak, slow to anger. So whenever he writes this in this one verse, he knows what he's going to do later in chapter 3. He's about to expound on it a little bit. So we're going to look today at something I want you to think about, which is the power of your tongue. If you're supposed to be quick to listen and slow to speak, all of a sudden now when it's time to speak, you better make sure that what comes out of your mouth is going to be good. That it's not just good in that you had something good to say, but it's literally the goodness of God rolling off of your tongue. A lot of people have a lot of things to say. Most of it ain't good. So I want you to stand up with me. We're going to read James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12, and then we're going to get into this. Here we go. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Mm-hmm. Pleasant. Verse seven, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, common theme here, right? Can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can salt produce fresh water. So Lord, let your word penetrate our hearts today. Holy Spirit, have your way. And in Jesus' name, amen. Do you know that words have power? Yeah, you can sit down, sorry. Words have power. It says in Proverbs 18, 21, that death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. You hear a verse like this and you're like, yeah, death and life, death. You're gonna eat the fruit of death. Listen, I wanna do this more. I wanna kind of shift a little bit and talk about the life that you get to eat when you realize that the words you speak carry life. But you also have to know they hurt and carry death. Listen, I want you to understand this morning something very, very important is that the tongue is important. You have to look at the importance of the tongue. James chapter three, verses one through two, it starts out and he says that you shouldn't become teachers. You have to realize a lot of times it's fun because like when, when you get to the place where you get to be the teacher or the preacher, you realize very quickly, it ain't all that's like led up to be. You thought, oh, this is gonna be fun. You're gonna stand up and preach. It's a very small window and a lot of pain afterwards. You know what I mean? Not everybody should aspire to get up in front of everybody and teach and preach. You know why? Because there's a target on you the enemy loves to shoot arrows at, right? So when you stand up and you begin to teach and to preach, you have to be very careful that you didn't do it out of some sort of selfish, vain conceit because you wanted people to hear what you had to say. That's not in alignment with what James said in chapter 1, verse 19, where he says, be slow to speak because your tongue is important. You know, we all learned a valuable lesson in 2020 about how important the tongue really is. Netflix, everybody's watching Netflix in 2020, weren't you? 
Like you had nothing else to do but sit around and watch Netflix. And we learned something. We watched this documentary called uh, about Joseph Maldonado, the Tiger King. <laughs> now here's what's, <laughs> follow with me, okay? Joe Exotic was a big cat breeder. He owned a zoo. He lived in Oklahoma, which should say enough. He was a country singer. You know what else he was? He was a candidate to be a governor of Oklahoma. Now, let me explain something to you. The telling is very important. And when you run for office, when you, when you aspire to be in front of people and to lead, in other words, you're gonna have to say something. You've got, you, if you're gonna run for governor, that means I got something to say and I think I can lead people well, right? Did you know he ran on a libertarian ticket? I'm not speaking ill against the libertarians. I'm just saying he ran on that ticket and received 16% of their vote, which was only 664 people, you know? But still, 664 people heard Joe Exotic and thought, that's my guy. That's, that's the one. That's, that's who's going to lead us out of this. You know what we learned from that? We don't need to hear from everyone. Right? Like at some point in time, we need to stop and go, you know, YouTube gave everybody a voice. Not everybody should have it. I, I was very disheartened this week. You remember that girl that was on, uh, uh, what was that, Dr. Phil, right? Remember the girl's like, cash me outside? Do you know she's worth millions of dollars? Lord. <laughs> you, I wonder sometimes how. How did enough people come together and be like, we want to hear this girl say, cash me outside at a club? Let's go. Let's make sure the promoters give her a ton of money because we want to hear her speak. Listen, We've learned lessons. We don't need to hear from everybody. Our culture has decided that everybody has a voice and everyone's truth matters. It doesn't, right? Like, it's true. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be very honest. As I stand up here, I want you to know something. My truth doesn't matter to you. It shouldn't. The truth and the word of God is what should actually matter. My job as a teacher is to stand up here and to proclaim the word of God. Every word that comes out of my mouth should be anointed by the Holy Spirit so that when it lands on your ears, you receive it in the same manner it left. Holy Spirit to Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Now, the problem is, is that we start listening to a lot of people. We turn off the Holy Spirit filter. And we just receive any teacher that comes along. Oh, I like that. Why? It says in scripture, it'll start to tickle your ear. You're like, oh, that feels really good. So when the Bible tells you to deny yourself, but other people go like, no, 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 you've got to express yourself. You're like, wait a minute. Do I listen to the word or do I listen to the teacher who twisted the word enough to make me feel really good about this? We gotta be careful. And you gotta know that all throughout the scripture says that in Romans 12, it says we have different gifts according to the grace that's given us. The Holy Spirit gives gifts. Teaching is one of them. In 1 Corinthians 12, it says, and God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third, teachers, and miracles, gifts of healing. Listen, these are in the church given to us by Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God. Like we have gifts in the church and it's teaching is one of them. Ephesians 4, so Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to what? Equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ could be built up. Listen, there, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, they implanted teachers in the church so that the body can be built up, right? That's the purpose of teaching and preaching, so that you can be built up. That doesn't mean that I'm the only one here that can do that. We, we have plenty of people who should be teaching and preaching. I thought of it like this, and when Moses was leading the people out of Egypt, his, his father-in-law finally came to him and was like, listen, you need to share the load, bro. There's too many people here. And all of a sudden, he started creating different pockets. Some of them had 1,000, some 10,000, some 500, and he put people in charge. Listen, we believe in connect groups here because I believe there are pastors and teachers who are in this room who are designed and gifted by the Holy Spirit to lead small groups of people into the Word of God. This is not the only area in which teaching and preaching should be coming from, okay? So you have to understand that. And you have to know the Lord has put an anointing on some of you to begin to teach and to preach, which means you need to be wise and understanding. You need to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Why? Because maybe God's calling you to be a teacher and a preacher in a smaller setting. So how do we know that someone has a gift? You ever seen somebody try out for a worship team and can't sing at all? How many of us would love to let David Fish just put everybody up there who says they have the gift? Did I, did I step on somebody's toes? There's a reason I'm not on the praise team. You know what I mean? But if you can't sing, we're all like, oh, 
bless her heart. <laughs> you know? Same thing with preaching and teaching. If, if, if somebody gets up and just, don't, don't eyeball me when I say, if somebody just gets up and rambles around and never really lands anywhere, you're like, maybe you don't have the gift, brother. There are, the gifts are given to us and we should be able to see them. They're evident why the body should be built up. Okay, so we're gonna move into this next one, direction of the tongue. I'm gonna try to clip along here. We were, we've lingered a little bit. So direction of the tongue. There is a direction of your tongue and he talks about James 3, three through four. He says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. All day they are so large and are driven by strong winds. They are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants them to go. In other words, when the Holy Spirit begins to blow in your life, guess what can steer you off course? Even though the Spirit is moving in your life, your tongue can shape the direction that he's trying to push you. Did you, you catch in some of this? Like, it's interesting that like, just because there's anointing in your life doesn't mean you're heading in the right direction. Sometimes you take that anointing and you'll steer it where you want. That's why I actually believe there are some teachers and preachers who are leading whole congregations astray. And yet at the same time, you'll see God moving in that ministry. You're like, how did all those people get saved? It's because it's just that very small rudder. He, he's deciding, she's deciding where the whole congregation is gonna go. But it's not only, listen, all of scripture talks about the power of your tongue. I see it in Proverbs, this wisdom book. Proverbs 10, it says this, the wise of heart will receive commands, but a babbling fool will come to ruin. You've seen people who talk too much, right? When Proverbs 9, 9, uh, 10, 19 says, There's, uh, when there are many words, wrongdoing is unavoidable, but one who restrains his lips is wise. Proverbs 10, 11, the mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. Listen, what comes out of your mouth is either death or or life. You get to choose whether you're a teacher or not. Listen, the direction of your life. Let me explain something to you. You want to change your walk with Christ. You know what's the first thing you can do? Is change what you say. Literally, if you want your life with Christ to grow and flourish, if you want your, if you're like, man, my walk with Jesus hasn't really thrived lately. I'm gonna tell you, before you, you start thinking about all the Bible studies you're gonna go into, how about this? Take, take a minute to think about all the words that come off of your lips and change them. And no more negativity. You may have it in your mind, but don't ever let it sit on your tongue. You ever heard of this? Your, your mamas are really good about saying this. If you ain't got nothing nice to say, they don't say anything at all, right? I feel like that should be the American mantra for a couple of years. If you don't have something nice to say, then don't say anything at all. Facebook would lose money if that's how that works. You know what we should be saying instead? Positive things. Encouragement. Building each other up. You know why? Because... Your tongue is like the rudder of the ship that your life is moving down. And when you begin to speak positive things, it's not just for the one who receives it, but it's also for you. You are literally shaping the direction of your life. You know who's the biggest encourager? We have an elder here. His name is Chris Hodges. He and I go running on Tuesday mornings, typically. I don't want to get myself in I don't go every Tuesday, but some Tuesdays. And, and I try to run with him. And if you ever try to run with somebody and talk at the same time, it's impossible if you're out of shape. So I'm like huffing and puffing. This dude, every person he sees on the trail, you know what he does? You're doing great. Yeah. I have never heard like a negative. He sees somebody running by there walking and said, like, hey, keep in there. You're going to get better one day. No, he's like, you're awesome. You look beautiful. And he's just running. He's the most encouraging person I've ever met. And you know the direction of his life? You know which way he's going? Straight towards Jesus. Man, it, it, because I can tell because the rudder of his life speaks positive, uh, uplifting, encouraging words all the time. Right. Always encouragement every day. It'll set the direction of your life. Do you believe that? There is a direction. There is a destiny for your life. And you want to aim yourself in the right direction? Make sure your tongue speaks encouraging, uplifting, building words. Yeah. Memorize the scripture and just speak that for a while. You know, like I always think about Jesus when he, was, when he was led out into the desert and the enemy comes up and the devil tries to tempt him. Jesus had everybody to be like, you shut your mouth, you devil. He didn't say that. He used scripture and peak positive to like steer it back. I love that. That's not my go-to. It's easier to be negative, isn't it? It almost like makes you feel better. You ever gotten poison ivy? And, and you reach down, you start scratching it. You're like, oh, it feels really good. Half a second later, you're like, Terrible decision. <laughs> That's like every negative word that comes out of her mouth. The first, when it comes out, you're like, yeah. And you're like, oh God. You ever heard of burning bridges? Like, why? Why do we do that? It feels so good to light that match and fling it as we walk away. And then you realize, oh, I'm on an island. Oh, it's great. 
The third thing is this, it's the power of the tongue. I wanna change it though this morning. It's power on the tongue. James 3, five through six, I love how he transitions this just a little bit for us. He says, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Do you know the tongue is a fire? Do you see this shift? It's not just that like, you have a bit in your mouth and change one way. It's literally death and life are on your tongue. You listen, you want to have a fire when you go camping. You just don't want an uncontrolled fire. Fire is a beautiful thing to have in your house. It can warm the house or it can burn it down. You're supposed to have a fire in your heart for Jesus. But if you had a raging fire, I remember one of the times I was, I was pretty young in my walk with Jesus, and so bear with me, but I was driving down South Main and these people were standing out there with signs that said, you're going to hell. And as I'm driving by, my windows are down. It must not have been 108. Uh, and so I was driving along and some guy yelled at me as I passed by. He goes, you're going to hell. I slammed on the brakes pulled into the parking lot to let them know what I had to think about their evangelism tactic. I was like, you think you're going to get anybody with that kind of language? There's a, there's a rudder in their life that is sending them in the wrong direction. But I have looked at people and said, man, did you know that God loves you? And I've watched them go, oh, oh. man, I'm telling you, if you don't know how to evangelize somebody, just learn this. Do you know Jesus loves you? You know why? Because that's the truth. It's literally in the scripture. He loves you so much, he died for you. He loved you so much that he sent me, he, he divinely orchestrated this moment for me to be with you here at Waterburger. You know what I mean? Like I always like to throw out like some places I like to visit, you know? So you're just, you show up and you're there. I don't care where you're at, Funky Monkey, HTO. These are all the anointed places in town, just make a list. <laughs> you show up, you know what you get to do? Look around and be like, who's going to get it today? I'm going to tell you that Jesus loves you. Sometimes people who know it and they're like, yes, absolutely. I just, it's so good to hear it from another person. It's so encouraging. Let's hug each other. Let's pray together. Sometimes it's like, I don't know if I believe that. Listen, I don't care if you believe it or not. He sent me here to pray for you. What do you, what do you need? What do you need? Because I believe that God hears my prayer. What do you need? I believe that God's going to show up in that situation. How did God create the world? It's not a trick question. What do you do? He spoke. You heard of the Big Bang? I absolutely believe in the Big Bang. God goes, life, and goes, boom, and it all happened. <laughs> I mean, that's literally, I think, like, like, I've read these, like, studies they talk about, did you know that, like, the, the whole world, that, like, your whole universe is held together by sound waves? Like, I was like, what? And I didn't really go any further than that. It just blew my mind already. I was like, I'm out. but that God would speak. You know what happened? He allowed for something to rest in his mind. He thought, I want to bring some life into this. I want to bring people. I want to have community. And then he spoke it. He allowed for that thought to then move to his tongue. And when he spoke, life came. And I think that God had this wisdom and this understanding. And he knew, listen, when I make these little people all over this earth, I want them to be in my image. Do you remember all throughout scripture here that we were made in the likeness of God? You're not little gods. You're just a reflection of him because why? He wants little children all over this world to be adopted into his family so that you are living and breathing like him, that you walk around this earth and you are like God. You are like Jesus, not in that you have any power in and of yourself. No, we're just a clump of cells that God put together, put a soul in. He says, I want to shine through you. Does that make sense? So the, sometimes people try to take this teaching in the wrong direction. Like you can speak anything into this. You get to and manifest your own destiny. I'm like, you just shut that down, all right? Like, that is like, that's not even true. Listen, what you get to do is you get to speak the word of God. You have life and death on your tongue. And when the anointing of the Lord comes on your tongue and you speak it, things come to life. Like here, I'm gonna prove it to you. Ezekiel 37, one through four, watch this. The hand of the Lord was on me. He brought, this is Ezekiel. He brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, this guy says, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Why is this answer, right? <laughs> then the Lord said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Prophesy to the bones, Ezekiel, and you tell them, hear the word of the Lord. Not, hey, prophesy to the bones that they hear you speak. The bones don't need to hear Ezekiel speak. 
the bones need to hear the word of the Lord. And so when I, when I get up here today and I talk to you about the culture and what do we need, and we all collectively in this room said, Jesus, listen, I want to challenge you, church, that today you have an anointing on your life to in the spirit, to move among the dry bones of culture and begin to speak life. And you say, dry bones, come back to life. Hear the word of the Lord, dry bones, come back to life. You have a calling right now to receive the Holy Spirit, to walk amongst the dry bones of this world and speak and prophesy, come back to life. There's a lot of dry bones out today. Some of them are in your family. Some of them are your kids. Some of them are your spouse. Some of them are your coworkers and your neighbors. There's a lot of dry bones in the valley that you live in. And I know that you, if you will receive the spirit in, in Acts chapter two, one through four, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all gathered together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be, say it with me, tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What I love about this is that when the Holy Spirit fell, it didn't come down like a dove, like when it came down on Jesus. He's like, listen, I'm going to anoint your tongue with fire because you have the ability to have life on your tongue. If you would just prophesy to the dry bones around you and tell them, come back to life. They need to hear what? Not your words. They need to hear the word of God. So I can now, what? I can be very quick to listen. Mm. Mm -hmm. Holy Spirit, what do I need to say now? And he'll put a fire on your tongue and you get to speak and bring dry bones to life. I mean, like at some point in time, you either have to believe what the scripture is saying here for your life or you don't believe it and you just want to keep playing church. This is literally what James is trying to get a hold of us in. He's trying to get you to realize this all of scripture is saying there is death and there is life on your tongue. How are you going to use it? Will you continue to perpetuate the lies and the hurt and the pain? Are you going to continue to participate in the gossip and the cussing? Or will you choose to take the rudder of your life, the direction of your life, realize there is a power that comes from heaven to rest on you if you would only submit to God, allow for the Holy Spirit, be baptized in the Spirit and begin to speak. I didn't understand speaking in tongues for a really long time. I didn't really grasp it until I realized it's just a submitted tongue and the Lord says, I'm gonna use it however I want to. And there's multiple ways that the Holy Spirit uses your tongue. Sometimes it's just in a, in a, in a word and sometimes it's in, in like a, your own prayer language. Sometimes it's done through a praise or worship. Sometimes it needs interpretation because nobody knows what you're saying. Sometimes it's a foreign language that just rolled out. I'm praying for that one because I don't know any Spanish. Lord, can I have the gifts of tongue in Spanish? It's you, you read the scripture and it's there. And I, I think that today we have to understand that we have to have a submitted tongue. We need a submitted tongue so that the fire of God will rest on us so that when we speak, because I believe there are dry bones all around every one of you and God is calling you to say something God's calling you to prophesy over them. You know what? Prophecy is so encouraging. Prophecy is literally just the encouragement of someone. Just look at Ezekiel's example. Tell the dry bones to come to life. You got a friend that's hurting, suffering, going through a hard time? Ask the Lord, God, give me an encouraging word to take to my brother or my sister. And you prophesy over them. I felt like the Lord just says he's gonna encourage you. He's gonna build you up. I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know what he's going to say, but you have to have a submitted tongue. James chapter three, the first, the last verse here, he says, all kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And I thought, <laughs> that is not the way I want to land today. This seems so hopeless, doesn't? Until you realize, yeah, Apart from the spirit of God, your tongue will do a lot of evil. But when you submit yourself to God, because then he goes on and says, with the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father. And with it, we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. I'm gonna move to that last sentence. The salt water and fresh water don't go together. 
neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. We want our life to be full of the Spirit of God so that every word that comes from our mouth. So if you've had trouble this morning, I mean, you think over your life and you say, man, I've had some pretty ugly things that keep coming out of my mouth. Smith Wigglesworth has this to say. He says, let us not forget that possessing the baptism of the Holy Spirit means that there must be an ever-increasing holiness in us. This is not a matter of grabbing hold of your tongue and trying to make it say what you want. You have to just submit yourself to the Holy Spirit and say, I want to be baptized by the Holy Spirit the way the disciples were. I want to receive the Spirit of God in my life so that I can stand up and begin to speak and prophesy. And then when I prophesy, I just build up and encourage and I say, and hear the word of the Lord. If that's you today, if that's where you are during our prayer time, I want you to come down. We're gonna have our prayer team. So why don't you get prayer team, just come on down. Y'all gonna stand up here at the front today. If you feel like, man, I just want, first of all, I just, I want the words that come in my mouth to be encouragement. I want to be filled with love. I just want to be filled with just peace. And if you feel like you want some of that in your life and you want somebody to pray with you, please come down and have them pray with you. If you think to yourself, man, I don't know if I've ever been baptized in the spirit. I want you to find somebody, come up here and pray with one of them. They will pray for you. They will lay hands on you and pray that you would receive the spirit. Because while we stay submitted, God, I want your words to be on my lips. If you've never given your life to Jesus, it really does have to start there. You have to come down and give your life to Jesus, submit everything to him. If you needed healing today, man, I, I know God is a healing God and he does it all the time today. I don't want you to leave unless you get exactly what you needed. Because church, if our culture, if Weatherford, if Alito, if Willow Park and Hudson Oaks, if if there's anything that they need outside these walls, it's what? Jesus. So stand up. I'm going to, I'm going to declare something over you today. The way that the dry bones in our valley is gonna receive Jesus is if you will be brave enough to prophesy over them, to walk out of this place today and say, I will be changed. I've encountered the living God and I will declare with my tongue praise. I will declare with my tongue life to the dry bones that I see around me. I'm not gonna get into arguing and fighting, but I will go declare the goodness of God in the land of the living. It's a belief that when you speak the word of God in someone's life, the spirit of God moves in them, draws them in. You don't have to argue with anybody about a belief. You don't have to argue and try to prove your point to anything. They don't need your well thought out statements on different political viewpoints. You know what they need? They need what? Jesus. Man, if that became the the cry of our mouth, around in every conversation. Somebody that want to argue with you, be like, man, just, I'm just going to tell you right now, Jesus is so good. They're like, man, I was talking about this. No, no, I know that's what you're talking about. Let me talk to you about Jesus. So Holy Spirit, come in the room right now. I pray for a divine anointing. I pray for the, the tongues of fire to fall on us today, that you would come and you would just set on our tongues just your anointing, that your, your fire, your spirit would come and so move us. I pray that prophecy would begin to roll off our lips, that, that, that curse words are gone, that arguments are gone, that fighting is gone, division from our mouths is gone. In Jesus' name, I declare only peace and spirit-filled words to come from our mouths from this moment forward. I pray that today, God, that you would so move in our lives that that all we can see is the goodness of God. So lead us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.